God. We do declare this morning that holy is your name. grateful for this moment. And we ask you to pour out your spirit upon us. And we might grow and get closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. I was informed that one of our former members, Sister Audrey Staten, had passed last night. And so we want to remember uh, the girl's father passed a couple of months ago. And now the mother's gone. Age has something to do with bringing us closer to the time of our departure. And uh, it is my prayer that all of us live old enough uh, to recognize that the time will come. We ought not have to go home early. But uh, it happens. I'm still in the throes from my friend, Johnny A.G. McCann. Just turned 58 years old. And I was telling somebody the other day, Johnny never, never met a stranger. He was always exuberant in his personality outgoing, and he made you feel at ease. And on a treadmill, something that they say keeps you healthy. On a treadmill, the date of expiration on his heart came due, and he died. It's hard to take, but it is a reality that death awaits. Everyone that breathes. I would only say to you, draw nigh unto God. Don't play with it. Don't play religion. You never can tell when your time is up. Amen? Amen. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, Does Prayer Work? Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Verse 10, now verse 19 through 20. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lion? 
those crap work. All of my life, I've been taught that I should always pray. When I was a little lad, my daddy taught me my first prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I was also taught to pray before eating. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon this food we are about to eat. May it give nourishment and strength to our bodies. Uh, bless the hands that prepared it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everywhere I go in this country, I find people praying that prayer. No matter what section of the country, you were taught that to bless your food. I was also taught to pray on a daily basis. When I rise in the morning and when I go to bed at night, my Sunday school teachers impressed upon us as young Christian boys that we ought to pray on a daily basis. I also heard sermons on prayer during the worship hour, but many times I left the church feeling like prayer was a magical formula I was to utter in order to bend God's will to my will. I did not see prayer as having a conversation with God, nor did I see prayer as a way that I remained in constant communications with my Creator. Prayer was an add-on to my life, something good Christians did to show and prove that they were devout. But the question always loomed before us. Does prayer work? I've heard many times in my life that God can do anything but fail. But sometimes I wonder if this is true. And if you're honest with me, and if you're honest with yourself, you also wonder to yourself sometimes if it is true. I want to submit to you that it is always true for the person who spends time cultivating a relationship with God. If God is an add-on in your life, don't expect God to do great things for you. If you just say, I got to do this in order to be religious, then you don't have any great desire to get to know God. Paul says, I want to know him. And the question is, as long as you live, you need to learn who God is. And I don't care how old you are, you won't know enough about him. That I may know him. That's, 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 that's what this, this whole issue about having a conversation with God is all about. That I may know him. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's not something that I treat like a spare tire. When, 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 when my tires go flat, I, I call upon God. I learn then what prayer is all about, but I want to be able to talk with Him when things are going well. I want to be able to talk with Him when I'm at the mountaintop. I want to be able to talk with Him when I'm down in the valley. going on in my life. 
relationship yeah. with God. Let me give you some background for my text this morning. The Babylonians had conquered Judea and carried away into captivity a group of the youngest and brightest of the Jews to employ them in their governmental system. Daniel was in that number. He, along with three other Jewish boys, vowed to remain faithful to their God, even though they were in a foreign land. And even though their God did not prevent them from falling prey to their enemies, they refused to divide, defile themselves by eating meat from the king's table. They knew meat from the king's table had been offered unto idols, and by eating the meat, they would eating the meat would be for them to deny their God and turn away from their religious upbringing. God honored their faithfulness, and they became high officials in the Babylonian government. When the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon, King Darius kept Daniel and his three friends working in high places within his government. All of this was possible because Daniel and his three friends remained faithful to their God, even in a foreign land. Can you remain faithful when you're going through a storm? Can you remain faithful when nothing is working right in your life? Can you remain faithful when your marriage is falling apart? Published. 
he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Under the threat of being thrown into a den of hungry lions, if he prayed to his God, Daniel refused to alter his pattern of life. He prayed before the edict three times a day in his room where the windows were open facing Jerusalem. After the decree was made known, he went to his room that was facing towards Jerusalem and three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed openly. After all these years, Daniel continued to cultivate this relationship with his creator by spending daily time with him. How much time do you allow in order to cultivate your relationship with God? Do you, do you spend time in prayer? When you come to worship on Sundays, do you worship? Or do you watch the clock? situation that Daniel was in. What would you do? Would you take a stand affirming your relationship with God? Or will you for the next 30 days go private with your relationship with God? If the truth be told as Christians we are placed in similar situations almost daily. Amen. Will we take a stand for our God or deny Him? When our friends and loved ones and our families, our schools, our jobs, our fraternities, our sororities and lodges belittle God or blaspheme God or ridicule God, to our face. Will we shrug it off as a harmless remark and continue in the fellowship without sounding the alarm that you will never deny or betray God, even if it means to be an outcast in society? Will you take a stand? Regular folk. I had a preacher once tell me, say, Say, Alan, you know what your problem is? I said, No, what is my problem? Tell you the truth, I didn't know I had one. But he says, he said to me, he says, you're not regular. I was, I was at a, a conference in Lake Yale, Florida. The preachers from all over came to that conference. And that night, they gathered in 
one of the guys who they, they was talking and, 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 and challenging the, the presenters. And, and I, I went, I heard that they were doing this, so I went. And one of the fellows said to me, uh, Alan, what you want to drink? <laughs> and I said, uh, nah, I don't want anything. Yes, sir. Later on, one of the fellows said to me, he said, Alan, I got to go over and get something from, from my room. Can you walk with me? I said, yeah. He said, now, Alan, you notice how people stop drinking? When you refuse to take a drink, you could have got a glass of Coca-Cola. They wouldn't know what was in the glass, but at least you had a glass in your hand. You don't go into things like that. I said, I don't drink. I don't attempt to drink. And I take offense that you think that I've got to change in order to be accepted by my peers. I refuse to change. A lot of us say, okay, I can I can I can I can hang. I can have a glass of coke in my hand. They won't know. A, look, a few months after Nettie and I got married, this couple invited me and headed to their home. And they were nice people. And, um, the food was good. There was a glass with something in it. And uh, I tasted it. And uh, I said to, to, to my host, what is this? And he, I forget the name of it, but some kind of duck. When we pray that 
God heals a loved one who is suffering from cancer. And we pray according to God's will for ours. Listen, beloved. I know you love me. And I know you want to keep from here. But cancer is a rough disease. I remember the day when the ambulance went to Deacon's tomb's house to transfer him from the house down to Calvary. They had him on a sheet. And when they picked the sheet up, it screamed. Even the sheet touching his body was painful. And if you pray that God would keep your loved one here while they're going through that pain, you don't love them. Do we pray according to our will or do we pray according to God's will? When we pray for a motion, a promotion on our job, and we're passed over time and time again, will we pray in God's will or ours? Well, let me, let me simply put it this way if I can. When you pray, you ought to say, Father, this is what I want, but if it's not for me, I'm off the Take away the desire. If it's not for me, you don't know what's for you. You don't know what's not for you. But God knows. I remember. I remember when I was graduating from seminary. I went down to Daytona Beach, Florida, and I candidated at a church. And the chairman of the Deacon Board told me, I was a Reverend you the man. And I, I felt kind of happy and pleased. And went back to New York, never heard another thing from him again. <laughs> a year later, I candidated at a church in d -Land and was called as pastor. And I went to that church, and d -Land is 18 miles from Daytona. And I got to see the church in Daytona up close. I got down on my knees, and I said, Father, you know that I didn't need that. <laughs> You've got to understand, there are some things we want, but we don't need. Being in a relationship with God means that I'm willing to subjugate my will, my desires, my dreams, and ambitions to the will of the Almighty. But this relationship with God, and you need to understand this, will show itself by demonstration of His mighty power. What do you mean, preacher? Our relationship with God is more than being doctrinally correct. More than being able to tell you how many books there are in the a Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. More than just being able to quote a few scriptures. Our relationship with God is more than shouting on Sunday. Our relationship with God demands a demonstration of the power of God in our world today. Yes. Yes. We need a demonstration of the divine power of the Almighty. Yes. Yes. Only such 
a demonstration will silence the Lord's enemies uh -huh. and leave no excuse for unbelief. Our churches should be such laboratories where the power of the Almighty God is constantly on display. However, this power is lacking today. One scholar says, we, we preach doctrine, but live natural lives. We yield to pressure sufficiently to conform to the world about us. We are governed by policy rather than principle. Our lives are characterized by unbelief and disobedience instead of faith and obedience. We preach, but do not practice. The Holy Spirit is ignored and quenched, and even those who would believe are disappointed. There is seldom any divine deliverance. The gospel we preach is too often in word only. Our text proves that we can expect a demonstration of divine power when we remain true to our relationship with God. Reluctantly, King Darius reprimanded Daniel to the lion's den where he was to spend the night. But listen to what King Darius told Daniel. May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Did you hear that? Or did you miss it? The king was aware of Daniel's daily routine. He notes that Daniel did not shy away from his relationship with God. The king said that Daniel served his God continually. And therefore, the king expected his God to save him. Even though he was being thrown into a den of hungry lions. Will this God come to the rescue? Will this God make a way out of nowhere? Will this 